and you call it whatever you're told to call it. I get that. Yeah, it's fine. She calls it a hutch, <laughs> so that's what I call it. Yeah, yeah. right? Yes. Deal? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community, and Business. module for that there of course there is cool so um, for everyone who's watching us now live or later in the reposted recording this is an offshoot of the Acquia podcast this is called jams Drupal camp which I think is a pretty catchy name and I had the idea that I get to see a lot of cool sessions, people talking about technology, talking about Drupal especially, but other things too. And some of these sessions just kind of get lost or it's hard to really find something from the past. And I'd like to take the chance to just bring some more attention to some things that I thought were cool and exciting. So I dreamed up the virtual Drupal camp, um, which you can find on Acquia.com. It has a landing page and it'll be also included in the acquia.com slash podcast stream and in the blog stream. So um, welcome everyone who's watching. Today I have with me Brent Wynn, who also happens to work at Acquia. And um, I believe your title is something like Solutions Architect. Is that right, Brent? Yeah, that's right. Okay, so let's, let's um, why don't you kick off your presentation, giving us just a tiny history of the demo framework, and then I am going to turn off my mic and turn off my camera and leave the next 30, 40 minutes to you. Sure, yeah, so quick history. Um, when I came to Acquia in, uh, at the end of 2012, this is the beginning of 2013, we effectively had a lot of different people working in sales and everyone was kind of showing Drupal in different ways. There was not really a very unified pitch around Drupal, so one Acquia demo of Drupal that you might see might be completely different than another. And this was really difficult for us because um, we didn't have a consistent messaging. So it, w it made uh, for a really difficult sales cycle. Um, and at the same time, there was a lot of rework being done by the different solutions architects that were working at Acquia. They were putting in a lot of extra hours, kind of rebuilding Drupal demos over and over, uh, building sort of one-off POCs all the time. And, and this none is, of it was this has got to be. This has got to be really familiar to anybody in a web agency, everybody, anybody doing Drupal pitches on anything like a regular basis. So this is a, a very common problem. Yeah, so that, that was sort of presented. Here's the problem, and um, I was brought in as to work solutions architecture and, and give demos, but also work on some type of way. And I was basically just told, can you make our demos like more consistent and reusable? And this is sort of with working with Christian Yates and some other people within the Department of uh, Solutions Architecture basically came up with the ideas around what, what would eventually become the demo framework. Um, which was originally just a prototype name. We were just like, we need this demo framework. And we just kind of kept the name in the end because it is very, it's just, it's specific to what it is. If we had called it something else, it would be confusing about what it was. So we just left the name as is. And it's something that we use every day now at Acquia and, and partners are using it. And so, yeah. All right, and where can, I, where can I find that online? So you can find it online on drupal.org. It's project slash DF. It's the short name, so cool. that's a good way to search for it. Um, another place you can go to acquia.com slash downloads slash df, and you can actually just click try me, and it'll actually spin up a, a demo for you. We have a, kind of a one-click install going these days, so pretty cool. Right. Awesome. Anyone who's following along at home, the slides that Brent is about to present, there's a link to GitHub. I will also include that in the show notes when I repost this on acquia.com. Brent. Go. All right. So I talked a little bit about the demo framework, and we talked a little bit about myself already. But just to recap, um, my name's Brant Wynn. I'm a solutions architect at Acquia. Um, I maintain the demo framework distribution. I also work on POCs, Skunk Works type stuff at Acquia, uh, R&D work. And a lot of it just revolves around what goes into this demo framework. Um, on top of that, I do. Um, 
I work on the uh, certification exams that some people um, have been taking, which is uh, a fun sort of side project that I've been working on. And I also am uh, one of our Tiger team uh, D8 leads. So I basically help uh, some people at Acquia get onboarded to Drupal 8. Um, so yeah, and I'm Brent Wynn on Drupal.org, uh, on Twitter, and the rest of the internet. So if you're looking for me, I'm pretty easy to find. So selling Drupal. This idea of like, you know, walking into a room and saying, you know, here's Drupal, I'm going to set it down on the table and check it out for yourself. It's a packaged product. Obviously not the case. And even from a digital perspective, uh, not actually the case. So selling Drupal can be a really confusing process. It can be difficult for um, really everybody involved. So you have uh, stakeholders, everything from the person that just wants to know what is Drupal is completely confused about um, you know, the, the entire situation. They've really just heard of Drupal, and they want to know more. Um, you have people within organizations that know about Drupal, and they've heard about it, but they don't know why they actually need it. Um, they've been told by someone that, hey, we should use Drupal for x, y, and z. And they said, why? Um, and then there's also this sect of people that don't actually know who it's for in the organization. So is it for the marketers that work here? Is it uh, strictly something that the developers are going to be working with? Um, are we going to be using it for websites? Is it going to be used for applications? Um, really not, not understanding who can use Drupal within the organization is, a, is another confusing problem that people run into. So what we do um, at Acquia when we start talking to these people is sort of identify them as they're probably going to fall into one of these sections. And then we get a little bit more specific. So we say, who are they? Um, and that, that might be their job, um, their role, just the current role that they're playing uh, in CMS evaluation. So they're evaluating Drupal. They're looking at um, all, all the other competitors or whatever. Um, and that's who they are. Uh, what makes them tick is another thing that is really important because we want to know really how we can effectively talk to them. So we want to know what some of uh, the things are that they do in day to day, uh, what their job entails, um, and so on, um, how they're using Drupal. So if they're already using Drupal in their organization, you know, finding out what they're currently doing with Drupal. If they're not using Drupal, it's more about how they will use Drupal. Um, so understanding basically who they are what they're doing at the organization, where Drupal fits into the situation, and then finally identifying what their frustrations are on any level. So if they're currently frustrated with the current system they're on, they want to get off of that system onto something else. Um, they're using Drupal maybe, but they're not necessarily using it as effectively as they could. Um, more often than not, with work, there's always going to be something that you're frustrated with or some type of part of your life that can be uh, made easier through some type of technology if it's implemented correctly. So finding where Drupal can fit in to actually make their lives easier is a super important part of understanding the audience. And so once you've done that and sort of decided, OK, this person is a marketer, or they're a developer, or they work in IT, um, maybe they're a business stakeholder or a CEO, that can really craft how you're going to start telling the story to these people when you demo Drupal. Brent, am I supposed to see your slides right now, or are you? Um, you're supposed to see the slides. OK, try, try sharing that again. Somehow. OK, let me see. So you were watching me the whole time? Uh, for the last um, minute or two, yeah. Oh, OK. Um, you were in a roll, about, though, so I didn't want to, you know. What about now? Nope, I'm still me. OK. All right. So yeah? Yes. OK, great. So you guys missed some GIFs. Yeah, we had some entertaining ones, like these guys, <laughs> or these different stakeholders, ALF, people that don't understand what they do within their organization. And here's the slide that I was talking over for the majority of the time, talking about what people do and who they are and, and how we identify them as an audience. So it gets to the point where you know they're ready to see something, and you want to show them something that's going to really wow them. And this is where Drupal uh, historically has uh, you know, fallen uh, and, and really stumbled at times in these situations. So you know, one thing that people like to do is um, 
they pull up, you know, they're in the middle of a sales call or they're in, they're in the room with someone and they pull up Drupal.org and they just sort of start talking about um, Drupal with the example of, you know, showing different module pages and, and everything. And this, this site is a great site. Um, if you're familiar with Drupal, you probably use it all the time. Um, and if you're a contributor to Drupal, you spend most of your life on this website. And that's really what this website is for. It's for people that are contributing to Drupal, people that are already using Drupal a lot, people that need information. So it's really developer oriented. It's not really um, marketer oriented or uh, business stakeholder oriented. Most of its content is around how you're actually going to technically implement Drupal and not so much about how Drupal is a good uh, business use case. They do have this little sites made with Drupal, which is nice. And I'll get into why that's not necessarily the best demo either in the next slide. So let's say that, you know, the White House slide is up on, uh, on Drupal.org and you click on that and you say, okay, so I'm looking at the White House website now and I see that it's on Drupal. I can't log into the White House website and to me it really just looks like a website. So um, it could be anything at that point. Um, and there are times also where, you know, people in different organizations that are showing Drupal will show uh, a client website and they'll actually be able to log into it, but they can't really necessarily make changes because uh, it's a dev website or they might actually have a lot of specific architectural things that they've done with Drupal that they'll end up spending more time around the implementation of Drupal and what they had to do to change Drupal and uh, really the story of how this Drupal website came to be or how it works more than how Drupal works. And so that's not necessarily a good way to, to show Drupal either because you're, you're at that point you're telling a story more about whitehouse.gov and Drupal goes into the background. And it's not so much uh, about Drupal being successful. So it's great if you're just saying, oh, you know, all of these different great organizations, uh, big, big time people are on Drupal.org in order to give it sort of like what I like to call street cred. But it's not really good for a demo because uh, you can't actually show people how they'll really be using Drupal. So the next uh, way that people show Drupal, and this happens, I think, fairly frequently, and this is we went ahead and we just sort of threw together a quick Drupal demo for a client because they, you know, in this case, they probably specifically said, we want to see groups, we want to see group management in Drupal. So someone probably spent the better part of, um, you know, a couple of days or whatever setting up this sort of group website out for an, sort of a demo of out-of-the-box Drupal that could show some functionality. So this is a really poor way to show Drupal. It's not a good representation of what Drupal actually is. Um, and it's confusing to people because while it is Drupal out of the box, this looks like core with maybe the organic groups module turned on and some other stuff. Um, it's not necessarily a story that they can follow and, and see. It's just, here's a list of all the different functionalities you told us that you need. And in a very quick and dirty, ugly sort of way, we've thrown this together. And that can leave a really poor, uh, poor impression on people, um, especially on people on the marketing side of things, because they get so focused on branding and all of those things. And so when they see that this is Drupal, they, they might completely be overlooking the message that you're trying to tell just because of the fact that this is not necessarily what they really thought that they were they were buying into. So while you're able to log in and make changes, you're still in, not in a really good position. And you probably spent a lot of time uh, working on this and crafting it for the specific client. And then as soon as they're out the door, it's not really reusable for, for anyone else. So the, the takeaway for, for people oftentimes is this is more complicated than I really thought, and I don't know if I'm ready to, to really ingest this information. And it's it's not putting them in a state where they are, you know, actively um, thinking about Drupal at that point. They're more thinking about, you know, is there something else that's a little bit easier that I can understand? So in coming across these problems at Acquia, we decided that, you know, there there have been good demos we've given, there have been bad demos um, and everything between, but the formula that we came up with for success was pretty much threefold. First off, it's all about storytelling. So you want to be a really good storyteller. You want someone to be able to sit back, relax, and watch a case study, watch a demo while passively taking in all the information. So if you don't want to be going through a, a checklist of features and make, making sure that the guy with the RFP in front of him is, is checking off features. You want that to all be happening very organically through, uh, through a pitch that you have well crafted. So that's where number two comes in. You basically decide, um, you know, based on the script, how you're going to pitch this, how you're gonna follow, how there's gonna be a flow that you're gonna run through this, and you're gonna use the same demo 
every time for these situations. And that's where standardization comes in. So you make a reusable demo that you can effectively give to everyone in the organization. They all know the script. They've been able to perfect their you know, particular pitch, their nuances, how they go through, but everyone is fairly well standardized at this point. And that makes for an effective messaging because if down the line, say, um, someone's unavailable for a follow-up call, we can bring in someone else and they can bring up the same demo and, and, and really pick, off where, pick up where someone else left off because we're all standardized. So, um, you know, that's where Demo Framework comes in, obviously, um, matching for all of these things. And that's, in this case, there's, that's the distribution. You're installing the distribution in the demo framework, and it is basically matching your use case. So an often used adage, there's a module for that in Drupal. In this case, for demos, there really is a distribution for that. You could use other distributions if you want for demos. Um, I'm not going to say that you shouldn't use Commerce Kickstart to show commerce. I'm not saying that you shouldn't show Atrium for community or comments or anything like that. But this they have been those have been crafted to specifically be production type websites to be built out whereas the demo framework has the specific idea that it comes with a script it comes with the idea it's very sort of lightweight in its uh, content and and you're basically following um, you know our patterns and building on top of that and so you basically are taking all of these great modules from Drupal and having them installed ready to go um, and you're standing on the shoulders of giants in that case because you have all these best practices lined out for you, and it's really just at that point uh, up to you to enable uh, your client by doing uh, telling a good story. So when it comes to open source and working, and this is something that we found in working on the, on the demo framework, we very much could have easily you know, forked Drupal or something and taken it in and built our own proprietary distribution and just shared it amongst Aquians, and that was sort of it, and we could have you know, really kind of cool but not reusable for everyone else we didn't want to do that we wanted to follow the open source ethos and so this is why we made it open source um, because you no know, ultimately you know, we were using existing work we wanted to build on top of that existing work can make it better so we've been able to work on things like media in Drupal and improve parts of Drupal and it's you know not only made Drupal better for for us but for everyone else but um, you know it's allowed us to basically say you know you know our job is to evangelize Drupal like Jam said but you know at the same time, while we're working on it, we may as well build and pay it forward, and because that's going to help everyone in, in in the process. So, you know, following these rules on any project you're working on with open source is something that I recommend, and it's something that we've done. So, at that, it's time for a demo. And what I'm going to do now is jump into a couple of case studies for a couple of different um, user personas in uh, in our in our demo, and I'll be talking about you. Know, you know, basically, I'll be talking over what what I would pitch to someone who's who's new to Drupal. So I have this site that's spun up, and it is uh, called World Travel Nexus. And World Travel Nexus is a uh, a a content uh, curator, but they're also a travel reseller. So they have uh, they have blogs on their site. So you see this bike, the USA blog, but then they also have packages. So they're actually selling. They have e-commerce on this site. Um, they also run contests. Basically, their idea is to be very social, um, have a lot of good content for people to be coming back to the site frequently, and ultimately being able to, um, you know, sell uh, uh, trips to their uh, potential uh, customers that visit the site. So there's different things, articles, uh, some videos on the site. We can see how there's some um, some Twitter stuff that's been brought in um, through uh, feed and things like that. So we can really see how Drupal integrates with uh, some some external systems. And it also uh, does really cool things for personalization. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to log in as um, a girl named Jennifer. So Jennifer is a woman that uh, has visited this site before. She already signed up and made an account. And um, in doing so, she answered a couple of questions to us, sort of uh, what, uh, what type of um, vacation would you like to go on? Uh, are you interested in tropical vacations? Are you interested in uh, more business trips? Things like that. And so her answer was, I was more interested in tropical vacations. And so at that point, we knew that about her. And when she's logged into the site, the homepage changes. And we see that she has content that's targeted for her. So we see Island Life, uh, Tropical Paradise uh, package, a contest about a Caribbean vacation, and so on. So if I look at Jennifer's account, what we have built into this demo is um, her actual user persona. 
So um, if you can see this on the screen, her persona is an end user. So she's someone who's visiting the site. She's viewing its content. She's looking for stuff that's interesting and relevant to her. When we talk about what makes her tick, um, really just interesting and relevant content. She's a regular web user. Um, she's evaluating products. She might buy something. She wants to be able to navigate the site very easily and find the things she's looking for. She doesn't actually know that she's Drup using Drupal, so when we ask how she's using Drupal, she's just looking for content that's relevant to her wants and needs and clicking on things and writing reviews, maybe blogs at some point um, on a site, but isn't necessarily you know, um, a back-end user. Um, and what frustrates her is uh, you know, sites that she can't figure out, sites that aren't easy to navigate, ones that she's not able to access uh, easily. So. Um, also, we see here, so these are the interests that I talked about earlier. So these interests are tied to Jennifer. She can change these if she wants, and it changes some of the personalization on the site, which is helpful to her. So if we go back to the home page, um, what we'll see is this contest for uh, win a tropical Caribbean vacation. And so that sounds like something that would be really cool. So Jennifer's going to go ahead and check that out. And we can see now that there is a call to action here for her to enter this contest. So she actually wants to uh, enter the contest, so she'll just click on that. And what happens now is a little bit of uh, a little bit of demo stuff happens here, where we see that it says a tr we've transmitted lead scoring to Marketo. So this gray box up at the top is not necessarily something that uh, Jennifer would see per se, but it's something that we show in this demo so that we can basically say that there's something that's happened in, on the back end. Um, what actually happened was that there's a module called rules in Drupal, and a rule fired when she entered this contest. This contest is really just a group in Drupal. She's been segmented into this group, and that has become redundant across another system. So we've essentially sent a lead score to Marketo that says that Jennifer is a lead, and she's definitely someone who's interested in, in winning a Caribbean vacation. So now we can follow up with email or whatever we need to do because we have her in that user segment. We also see that some things changed on the page when she entered the contest. So we can see that um, there's now a call to action to actually book a trip. And there's some um, product reviews that other contestants are talking about some, uh, some other things. So she, she can click on some of these. And these are all call to actions that are actually going to lead her to products. So the only thing that she can really click on now is to go to a product, which is really what, what our end goal was. We wanted to get her engaged and maybe uh, you know, drive that lead into um, some type of uh, generating um, generating a sale. So she went ahead and clicked on uh, the Tropical Paradise at Reasonable Rates uh, trip, and she's looking at this now. She sees that there's some product reviews. She sees here are the sort of the, the interests that, uh, that revolve around it, so she can search based on those. Um, and she can also, there's e-commerce right here, so she could add this to her cart. And this is a really cool part of Drupal, where basically you have e-commerce and the community aspect and the content all built into one. So when you might hear about content, community, and commerce in Drupal, this page really sort of uh, uh, embodies this. We have content, but we also have product that's tied to the actual price of the trip and the cart. And then we also have this community aspect where people are actually uh, interacting with this and, and writing product reviews and what have you. So all that built in, she can go ahead and add the product to her cart. And we'll see that once that's added, she gets a notification that the uh, the package has been added. She can open up her cart and look at it. And at this point, you know, we can talk about Drupal. Uh, its integrations for e-commerce are deep. You can, um, you know, really do any type of checkout system you want. Um, so if we view the cart, we could go through an entire e-commerce checkout with any number of integrations based on you know, how they wanted to sell uh, products. And um, you know, this is Drupal Commerce. So not necessarily a great demo at this point. You know, I'm not going to fill out a bunch forms and, and put in a fake address or anything, but we'll just say that she went ahead and uh, bought the vacation and returned to the site uh, a month later. So now she's returned to the site and she uh, went on a vacation. We see there's a little bit of different context shifting on the homepage. We still have her basic interests that are aligned, um, but we actually see a different um, article because we know that she already entered the contest, therefore we don't want to show that call to action to her anymore. It's not useful, so what we're going to do is provide her a different link. But at the same time, um, you know, her recent package is still there because she could potentially buy it again if she wanted to or whatever. But what she wanted to do actually is go ahead and visit it. and um, Scrolling through some of the reviews, she likes, she really had a good time, and she's going to write her own review. So I clicked write your own review, 
and now I've opened up um, a basic content editing part of Drupal. So I'm editing content now as Jennifer, um, but I'm doing so as an end user, so I don't have um, a lot of options in the WYSIWYG. So I basically have an end user role or an authenticated user. They're given a really basic, um, the ability to just you know post content, but they're filtered, so they're not going to be able to add in you know anything that would be spammy or whatever. Um, and she's going to go ahead and say, yeah, I had a great time. <laughs> so just a quick product review so you can see this. Um, she can go ahead and save her review and immediately will be sent back to the product page where we can see here's Jennifer and there's her review. So just a really quick end user demo that we can look at for you know, how uh, someone will use, use a website like Drupal and some of the strengths of Drupal on um, you know, sort of a front end level. So that leads us now though really to, this is really where people might start asking like, you know, hey, can we see something a little bit more than that? This looks like a regular website. And this is where we dive into really sort of the meat and potatoes of this demo. And in doing so, I'm gonna log in as a content curator or an editor. And her name is uh, Erica. Now, logging in as Erica, we'll see that she has her own personalization settings. You know, she's a user like anyone else. So she sees this content about um, Big Air at Big Sky, and uh, she sees some other uh, contests and things like that. But more importantly, what she sees is this toolbar at the top. So Erica, as an editor, has access to some of the backend features of Drupal. So she's able to open up this menu, and she can see that she has a workbench. She can view a content listing. She can see some of the site structure and work with that. Um, she can see she can manage products from the store and configure some other uh, light things. So she's not a full-on admin of Drupal. She doesn't have access to edit everything, but she can edit content. Um, but one thing that's important to note about Erica, in her ability to edit content, she can't actually publish her changes. So let's look at what happens with that. So we have this piece of content that says bigger at Big Sky. I'm going to go ahead and click on it, and I'm going to open it up, and we'll be looking at basically, you know, this published version of the content. And what Erica wants to do is she's looking at the content title. And she's thinking, maybe not everybody, especially international visitors or whoever, not too familiar with Big Sky. And let's know where, what state it's in. So she goes up to the top here and looks at this pencil icon and clicks on it. And that is going to immediately open up an inline editing mode. So now she's able to edit the content and make changes um, right on top of the, the content view. So she can actually see what it'll look like while she's working on it. So she's going to go ahead and say, Bigger at Big Sky Montana is going to be the new title that I'd like to change this to. And she'll save that. And what we'll note here is that when I click on the Moderate tab, now that I've made that change, I'm kicked into the back end. We see our Chrome. Everything around here has changed a little bit. But what's important to note is that now what I had was a published revision. And what I have now is a draft. So we've actually done a state change where we've changed the title. And if we view. Um, the revisions. So if we say compare revisions right here at the top, I can actually open this up and see, based on what happened, we updated the title through in-place editing. So if I go ahead and click view published again and go back into the site, I see that the title isn't changed. But what I do see here at the top is this new button that says view draft. And if I click view draft, I can see that I'm actually looking at the changes that I've made. I can go ahead and continue to work on the draft. I can open up inline editing and uh, change some things um, with the, the body here. You know, So if I want to bolt some text or whatever, I could do that or what have you. I won't bother right now. For now, I'm going to say that this change was enough. I really just wanted, as, uh, as Erica, I just wanted to change the title. And so now I'm thinking that this is probably ready to go live. Didn't make a major change. So I need to go through a workflow to um, basically be able to accomplish this. So I'm going to go ahead and edit this draft. And I can see that you know this is a new draft from the current revisions. And um, I have other actions to create drafts or whatever. We can see some of the different content editing um, uh, taxonomy terms that have been assigned these interests. And uh, probably really importantly, if I click on revision information, I can see that the moderation state is set to draft. And I'm going to go ahead at this point then and say, I want to change this to needs review. And I'm going to just log that this is edited by me. Let's 
be more specific. All right, and I'll go ahead and save that. So now we can see that this draft has been kicked into a needs review state. If we go back to moderate, we can see that um, there's been a change here. So that original draft that was created has now um, been changed. And we can go ahead and look at revisions if we want to. And this is sort of where it ends for Erica. Erica has now kicked this forward to another individual within the organization. And in this case, um, I'm going to go ahead and go back to the site and log out from Erica. And I'm going to log in as a reviewer. So a reviewer, in this case, is another editor, probably Erica's boss. And in this case, his name's Paul. And so one thing that I skipped over in the interest of time was just the, the whole user persona of an editor. Erica and Paul have really similar user personas. And I'm going to go ahead and open up Paul's user persona here and just sort of look at him. So who he is, he's someone that creates new content. This is true for he and Erica. Um, they both review and, and, and edit posted content. But the difference is really, for Paul, the fact that he can approve content to the production environment. All the things that make them tick and frustrate them, whether it's uh, things around editing content and syndicating it, is pretty much around needing this type of workflow so that they can remove things like mistakes, misprints, uh, explicit content that didn't actually need to make it on the site that did for some reason, whatever it might be, um, they need a workflow. So now that I'm logged in as Paul, what I can do is I can open up the admin menu and I can click on my workbench and I can go ahead and see this nice overview of all the different content that's on the site. I can see things that I've been editing recently as Paul. So it looks like Paul's actually been writing some dummy product reviews to kind of flesh out the site. Um, deceptive Paul. But uh, what we have here is a needs review tab. And Paul's going to go ahead and click on that. And he sees this needs review tab. Um, and he probably, in this case, like a rule probably fired. He got an, he got an email um, or whatever that said that Erica had something that was ready for him. So he knew that he needed to go to this page. This is something that's pretty common in Drupal. Uh, you know, as these state changes happen, you can queue off whatever you need, messages, notifications to people. Um, or it might just be part of Paul's regular everyday job to log in uh, in the morning and check out and see if there's anything on the Needs Review tab. So he gets here. He sees that uh, Erica has some stuff that needs review. And it's on this uh, Big Sky content. So he's going to go ahead and visit this content. And we'll see the content as it was. Nothing's changed. And he can just go ahead and do view draft, just as, uh, as Erica had before. And the big difference here, obviously, the content title changed. So he's going to go ahead and hit moderate. And basically, he's going to say, yep, this looks good to Erica. And he can go ahead and, and publish it. If he didn't want to publish it, he could send it back to draft and tell Erica why he didn't want that title change. But in this case, he's going to say it looks good. He'll click Save. And that's that. So now we see this is turned green. We no longer have a View Draft button. We have a New Draft button. And we have a View Published link. And we can see that now the title has been changed. So pretty cool thing where they were able to go through a workflow and eliminate any uh, mistakes by having some type of auditing system. And these states can be extended in Drupal. You can add new states if you want. So if you have a legal team that has to review stuff, if you have specific things need translating, you can mark something that needs translation. Um, it's really flexible system, Workbench, and it's something that you should check out for Drupal. So another thing that Paul does on this site sometimes is he works on these different uh, campaigns. And in this case, um, he wants to work on a campaign based on some of his own interests. So we go back to the site. It looks like Paul's really interested in um, Europe. And in this case, he's interested in, uh, it looks like his primary uh, interest is, is Munich. And he's thinking, um, you know, probably what they're going to do at Nexus is add some uh, Munich vacations to this, uh, this site soon. And so what he wants to do is go ahead and change this content and see if he can make it a little bit more engaging. So we'll go ahead and open up. Um, on his, on his site, the structure menu. And within the structure menu, Paul has access to collections. And Paul's going to look at this collection list. And he sees that there's already a collection called Munich Calling. And what he's going to do is use this collection to bundle together content and release it all at once. And not only that, but he's going to be able to um, take this collection of content and preview what the site will look like 
um, when that content is published. So if you think about the uh, scenario of, say, like um, the Super Bowl, in the Super Bowl, two teams go in, but one team uh, ultimately is the champion and so you might have two different collections if you are uh, the NFL you would have um, a collection for whether uh, say like the Chicago Bears win the Super Bowl or you have a collection for uh, when the New England Patriots win the Super Bowl and you want to publish one or the other but as you work on this content you want to be able to see what the website would look like in the future and that's where the site preview system comes in in Drupal so site preview system another really cool feature in Drupal that works with these collections so I'm gonna go back to the site and I'm going to go ahead and look at this Munich content. And as Paul, what I'm worried about now is what would happen if I changed this photo? So if I change the photo of Munich to something else, I know that on the homepage, it's not going to look the same as it does here. There's some text in front of it. It's bigger. Um, I want to make sure that it translates well so that before I publish it, it'll look good. And I'm going to go ahead and use the site preview system to do that. So I'll click on New Draft. And I'm going to load up this um, content editing screen that we saw earlier. And in this case, what I'm going to do is look at the image field here, and I'm going to remove it. And now I'm going to click Browse, and I'm opening up this content chooser, and I'm able to look at the library of all the different images that are available on the site. If I wanted to, I could also upload an image. So in this case, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to go ahead and grab another photo. In this case, I'm just going to switch this really quickly to Chicago. Because we're in the middle of a demo, it's not really necessary. So we'll say for this case, Paul just wants to see what the Chicago one would look like on the homepage. And in this case, he's going to go ahead and use the, the Munich calling uh, thing. And so again, we're using a Chicago image, but really in real life, Paul probably has a, a nicer photo of Munich available that I don't have on hand right now. Apologize. So we're going to make sure this is a draft. So if you look at publishing options, this is a draft. And most importantly, again, I've added this to the site preview collection. And now I'm clicking Save. So I'm saving a draft, and I'm actually putting this draft as a part of the collection. So what that means is that I'm still viewing the draft, and I can see this photo. But more importantly, when I go to the home page, while I still see right now on the home page the original content, there is this um, clock at the top, This what, what we can see is an interactive preview. And as I hover over it, I can open it up, and I can see here is my site preview. And I'm able to select a collection from the site preview system, in this case, the Munich calling selection, and I'm able to uh, enable it. And in enabling it now, what I've done is I've brought in the draft. So now I can see everything that was in the collection. So if I had you know, 10 pieces of content on the collection, everything would change. And now I'm able to surf around the site and see what this photo looks like in different places. So as it turns out, you know, this photo it looks like it's a little bit granular um, once it's blown up. So probably wouldn't be the best photo to choose for a homepage splash. Good to know. I wouldn't have known that if I had just published it. I would have had to unpublish and roll back things, and that would not have been cool. Um, if I click on uh, travel guides, which is what this content is, I can see what this looks like in the grid. So there it is, and we can see its twin because we stole a photo. And so that's a really great, useful tool. The site preview system gives you the ability to actually see what the site will look like in the future, given a certain uh, use case. Site preview system could also be tied into um, just uh, scheduled publishing, not necessarily collections. So it's a flexible, extendable system used by um, quite a few different organizations in Drupal to manage their content workflows and, and be able to preview stuff. And while we're on the topic of previews, one other cool feature I'd like to show while I have the site preview open is this um, page layout preview. So right next to the site preview, there is this responsive preview. And when I open it up, I can actually see that there's some different um, preset devices. So what I'll do is I'll click iPhone 5, and what will happen is this site will pop up, and it's going to load. And here's what it looks like on an iPhone. And I can go ahead and rotate. And so these are tools for content editors, for designers, for people that are working with Drupal, and they want to know what the content is going to look like in these different resolutions. As we know, responsive is super important. So we need to be able to see, hey, the title actually wraps here on an iPad. As a content editor, I know that I can make a change, basically that maybe I want to just have a better title that's works better for that case. Um, as a designer, I might want to say, OK, maybe in this case, we want to reconsider the height of or, or the width of the kerning on the text and work with these different things. So I can rotate the iPad and do all of this right within Drupal without having to, say, get out a bunch of devices and try it out. So a really useful tool. You can add your own devices to it and do um, lots of uh, you know 
basically different scenarios for um, what will happen. And of course, I can always turn off the preview and go back to um, you know the way that things were before. So that's content editing in Drupal and content previews and workflows. Some really cool tools that your content editors can take advantage of. Um, and then I'm and and but then there's probably one other user that I'd like to talk about if I have time, and that person is a digital marketer. So I'm going to go ahead and log out as Paul, and I'm going to log in as a digital marketer named Emily. So Emily is a digital marketer, like I said, and her whole deal at Nexus is she's on Twitter, she's on social media, she's promoting these different. Um, oops, I must have had a typo. Oops. So she's on the site and she's promoting different content and what have you, and she needs to be able to create landing pages very quickly, dynamically, easily. So um, you know she doesn't really necessarily have time. She has to be really flexible. You know things things are constantly happening. She doesn't have time to necessarily go to a designer and say design me out a landing page, and then go to IT and say execute on it, build it out. This can be you know a two week process for some organizations just to get a landing page up. And all the landing page is supposed to function for is um, you know to sit on the site and uh, be a place to drive and generate leads into. So you know track it with UTM parameter or whatever. So she needs to be able to create these on her own. So now that I'm logged in as Emily, I'm going to go ahead and open up the shortcuts here. And I see that I have a shortcut called Add Landing Page. So I'll click on that. And I see now I'm actually creating a new piece of content in Drupal. But I don't have a lot of different fields to work with. I'm going to build that dynamically later. So for now, what I'm going to say is I want to get people to come to London. So I'm going to go ahead and say, um, you know, summer in London is great. If I had any campaign identifiers, integrations with other systems, I could go ahead and bring these in. I can go ahead and tag this really quick. Uh, London, UK, that sort of thing, promo. If I need to make a specific menu link and add it to the, the, the nav, you know, temporarily or permanently, I can do that. I can go ahead and set the path. So in this case, I just want to make the path London. So we'll go to nexus.com slash London. I can actually drive people specifically to the URLs that I want to. Um, I have an entire plethora of uh, fields and things available for meta tags. Uh, uh, I can use available tokens within Drupal so I can take the summary or the, the site name and things like that and actually drop those in. So that's really cool stuff we can do. Cool tools, um, you know, and more importantly, you know, just creating a draft, working on something on the fly. So I'll click Save. And once this is saved, we can see that all I've got is this blank slate. It's just summer in London. It's great. So what I want to do now is build out this page. And you'll see that what has, what has changed for Emily as she's logged in is this specific ability to use a new menu at the bottom of the page. And this menu says customize this page or change this layout. And what she's going to do is click customize this page. And what will pop open now is this whole grid view of columns that she can go ahead and start adding things to. So she can go ahead and click this plus and add a new pane in this case. And this nice little modal comes up. And she's able to say, add a map. So she clicks Add Map. And in doing that, she's asked to enter an address. She can say London. And immediately, she gets this nice preview feedback. And here's a map of London that's been dropped in. So that's cool. She can go ahead and drop that map in. And this is just a widget now that she can work with. She can drag and drop it around in the layout. She can make changes to it. She could go ahead and edit it or delete it, whatever she needs to do. And so she's flexibly building a page right now. Another example, um, maybe adding a piece of media. So let's just go ahead and browse for a uh, London photo, maybe from the library. Um, and so here is a nice photo of London. I'll go ahead and put that in. So here's uh, London, uh, London Bridge. And I can go ahead and do anything else. So if I had a uh, snippet from any other uh, sort of third party, like Facebook, uh, Twitter, whatever, if they had given me some HTML, I even have the ability to drop in these little snippets. But it's filtered HTML, which is nice. So it's, it's basically locking her in. Uh, and she's working within the design of the site now. She's got styles available to her, things like that. So we'll go ahead and save this. And importantly enough, she's not limited to this single layout. So she can actually change the layout by clicking the Change This Layout button. 
and we'll see that there's actually a plethora of layouts for her to choose from. In this case, maybe she'll actually choose uh, a different layout. Let's, let's uh, sort of flip the switch here and have uh, the slider on one side and the gutter on the other side and, and just have three columns rather than six, uh, three columns with six uh, within. And so we can see how that changes very quickly and she's able to then uh, you know, continue to make changes. So at this point in time, she may have a designer give her some like splash imagery to work with and she can sort of drag and drop. If she needs to add something to this page dynamically, say she's just got a block that she wants to drop in, she can go ahead and do that. So if she wants to go ahead and add some more text or whatever, she doesn't have to go back to designer or whoever do that for her. And she can just do that very quickly and easily. So great tools for her as a digital marketer. So some different tools in Drupal that we show, basically with the idea that there are a lot of different user personas, a lot of different types of people that are potentially um, you know, using the system. And so that is sort of the basic demo that we do. I can also log in as an admin at times and I'll show a lot more backend stuff, things like that. But that's basically what we do. So I'm ready for questions if we have time. Grand. Thank you so much. That was very, very cool. So I, have, I have a question for you. Um, we pitched this as, hey, it's out there on Drupal.org and it's a fast way for you to make a reusable, reproducible demo, mm -hmm. right? But how much of that do I get when I go and download it right now? So that entire demo that I showed is a scenario for the demo framework. So I'm going to really quick just pull up my screen again, if you don't mind, and show you a page that will sort of um, make that more clear. So if we think about on here, when I open up as an admin, I'm able to see um, actually a number of different available scenarios based on what's available. We provide two scenarios out of the box from the Drupal.org version, and we've also been working on some other scenarios in-house that we plan to hopefully release soon. Um, so if I log in as an admin and we look at this, what I'll see when I first install the demo framework is this page that just tells me to choose a scenario. And once I choose a scenario, then what will happen is using um, both the features module and migrate, we're going to run this um, automated process that will not only enable all of the different content and things like that for Drupal, but it'll also import um, with migrate. And so that's super useful as well, because you can see that while this demo is not available, this digital marketer demo, the WEM demo that we saw is available. And there's a button here to reset it. So what that means is that even though I changed the content for um, uh, with, with uh, Erica earlier to add Montana to the content, or you know I changed some stuff as Paul, and I kind of mucked it up, I can really quickly just click Reset. And what's going to happen now is we're going to actually roll back all of the content using the Migrate module, and it's going to re-import it based on um, the default state. So I could give this demo again from the beginning and do it exactly the same way I did before without any, oh, this is from earlier when I was doing some stuff, sorry about that, sort of like walking around and being very careful. And this, so this prevents the demos from becoming stale. So this is the framework that you get and you're able to basically um, build your own scenarios on top of it using some simple um, hooks that we have provided and just by introducing your own migrate classes. So there's a ton of documentation around this on the site. If you click the documentation link on Drupal.org on the project. Um, and we really recommend people, you know, as a good place to start is just maybe fork the WEM demo that I gave and start making changes to it and figure it out from there. And you can go ahead and, and build your own demo. Gotten very comfortable with anyway. Is the, um, is that series of things that you did with the different user personas shown as a suggested script in the documentation? It is, yeah. So what you can do also is you can enable the advanced help module if you have the demo framework installed. And then what will be provided is an actual um, script like the full script I went through basically for each user that you can study and it has little screenshots available for you so you can follow through. So all the documentation, including the user personas and sort of what makes them tick, also the script are built into the demo. And that's a practice we recommend for people that are building them for their own organizations too. You guys have thought of everything. <laughs> <laughs> I have one question from the event page today. Uh, and the question says, the demo is all Panoply, I see. Is Panoply the future in Drupal? Well, 
I think that's an unfair statement to say that um, demo is all panoply. The demo is very panels heavy, and we definitely use um, a little bit of panoply in the case of the layouts that they provide. Those are great layouts. We don't actually use anything else from panoply besides its uh, live preview widgets. So there are two modules from panoply in the demo framework, but panels is used extensively. We recommend a panels architecture. Um, Commons also runs entirely on panels using Panelizer. I find panels to be very useful, and I do think that the future of Drupal might be more sites that are built using things like panels, built by people like the digital marketer. But as far as Panoply um, being pervasive and taking over Drupal, um, they've definitely done a really good job in marketing that namespace and sort of adopting panels as their own. But um, what they've actually done is built a nice distribution that installs some stuff um, on your behalf. So Panoply may or may not even exist in Drupal 8, but panels in some capacity will. Um, and so I definitely think that, that is, those are useful tools. And okay, Panoply so, is very cool. So panels good, uh, Panoply very cool. Thank you for uh, the San Francisco. Um, that's a chapter three Pantheon, that group of people distribution, if I recall correctly. Is that right? That's correct. So Matt Cheney um, exactly. is the, the maintainer of it. Ah, thank you, Matt. It's fun. Um, I see sometimes when I'm talking with people about client projects that uh, Panels is really powerful, really good if you wrap your head around how it works, and really good for um, you know devs and site builders. I've seen it go pretty wrong when you give panels configuration access to end users. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's very very powerful. I.e., you can screw a lot of stuff up too. So um, yeah. you gotta. I think using panels, you have to think two or three times about what you leave available to the end end users if they're not Drupal experts. Yeah, for sure. And in this case, you know, in the demo, we sort of leave things fairly open, but you actually see that there, there's a lot more things available if you were to log in as an admin and start doing things with panels versus if you were to log in as Emily. So the idea being that while Emily has access to a lot of layouts, we probably wouldn't actually give her access to all of those layouts. We'd probably give her access to like maybe five to choose from. Um, and we might prevent Emily from using specific widgets, but basically we try to put the handcuffs on these people so that they do a really good job working within the design style guide of the site, but they still are enabled. And that's really the important part. They need to feel enabled. They need to be able to use the tools in order for the, the organization to function. So right. it's they a trade-off. They should have the freedom to do everything that they should be able to do as well as possible. And mm -hmm. the peace of mind to know that no matter what they click, they're not going to break anything. Precisely. Cool. Hey, Brent, thank you so much. Again, thanks for taking sure. the time to show us this. This is JAMS Virtual Drupal Camp, which is an offshoot of the Acquia podcast, where I talk with people about open source Drupal technology community business stuff. And um, this will be up online as a podcast and as a video of the demo. Brent. Um, it is way past my dinner time here in Cologne, so I'm signing off. Thanks again. It was cool. Take care. All right. Bye.